Hi there. Welcome to Episode 7 of the Artist in Me is Dead podcast. I'm your host, Rhonda Willers. This episode features a conversation with Jasmine Swanson. Jasmine is a ceramic artist and teacher currently living in Oceanside, California. At one point after graduating from art school, she told herself, I'm never going to be an artist again, because it felt safe to say this. But as you'll hear, that only lasted for a bit of time because her creativity and urge to make came back. We explore what it means to find your voice again after a creative break and how she has always had this way of confidently doing things and knowing herself well enough to advocate for what she needs. Jasmine also shares how she avoids burnout by keeping her creativity and herself at a quick walking pace, not running and not strolling, but a quick walking pace that keeps her ideas and self growing. Please enjoy this episode with Jasmine Swanson. Well, hi, Jasmine. Thank you for joining me today to have this conversation. Hello. Thank you for having me. I was going to say good morning, but it's noon there. So yeah, still feels like morning. (laughs) (laughs) Truthfully. So where I want to start with you is if you could tell us about where your education in the arts started and um, maybe your pathway to going into that form of study, that field of study. Oh, um, my mom actually has a fine art degree from University of Minnesota Duluth. So I grew up kind of around a lot of photographs. She did a lot of photography and she was always really pushing creativity. If we were ever bored, she'd either be like, okay, go paint something mm. or it was go outside. So mm-hmm. I always chose usually painting something. So then in high school, really is when I kind of was like, I really like this. I started doing a lot of watercolor, like a lot of ink paintings and watercolor and like portraits primarily. And I was like, I'm pretty good at this. I could do this. Graduated high school, had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do. Actually, I thought I wanted to be a speech therapist because my younger brother is disabled and I had just spent so much time around different types of therapy Mm -hmm. growing up that I was like, I'll be a speech therapist two days before I was supposed to start at University of Mankato, I called my mom and I was like, yeah, I'm not going there. (laughs) And she was like, what? And I was like, yeah, I'm just not going to go to school there. Uh, That's, that's it. And she was like, you already bought all your stuff for like your dorm room and stuff. You're supposed to leave in three days. And I was like, yeah, I'll just get an an apartment in River Falls and see what happens and lived alone for like six months. I, I was 18 didn't know anybody wasn't old enough to like go out and meet anybody Mm -hmm. or anything so I just hung out alone in my apartment and worked for six months and then right before school started at UWRF I was like wow I could really I could just walk to campus from where I live Mm. um so I walked into the admissions office and just handed them my high school transcripts and was like hi I'm gonna start school here if that's okay (laughs) Uh, and they were like the semester starts in two days and I was like okay what do I need to fill out? Mm-hmm. And they were like, what do you want to study? And I was like, art. Uh, let's, let's study art. And they were like, okay. And they started talking about generals. And I remember very distinctly just saying to the woman, I was like, I don't want to take generals because I don't want to drop out. Yeah. So good point. yeah, I was like, I know myself, like I'm good at school, but I don't love it. So let's do the first couple of semesters where I just take classes that I like. Mm -hmm. and then like the not so fun classes I'll take as as I go Mm -hmm. and hopefully that just keeps me here Mm -hmm. and she looked at me like I was crazy and was like okay and wrote me into intro to glass blowing intro to photography a class in anthropology I believe and an art history class Mm. and just started the semester my first year and was like okay this is amazing I love this I Mm. can do this So something I heard you kind of through examples say, or explain is that you have like a confidence and a boldness in knowing what is right for you and what is not right for you. Could you like, where does that come from? Or what does like, how do you know to follow that? I don't know. I've just always been that way. If I'm doing something that doesn't feel right, I it just goes south so fast. Um, And I guess I was raised in a way like my mom was a single mom and I had a disabled brother. So it was 
a lot of like me being home alone with my disabled brother and just kind of improvising, taking care of him and I, and just kind of trusting what I thought was best Mm -hmm. from a super young age. And I guess as I got older, like if something just didn't feel right, even to this day, I'm like, "Mm." Mm hmm. Like, I, I know that I won't want to do this. Like, I, I guess I just know myself. I know that I get resentful relatively easily. Mm-hmm. Um, and I try to just, that it's not a good feeling. Right. Um, so I just am really good at being like, if I keep doing this, I'm going to really dislike it. Mm. Mm. So it's time to switch things up. Or if I'm ever disliking something in any capacity, I'm like, okay, what, what am I disliking and why? Mm-hmm. And what can I do to change that? Even since like now I've graduated college and moved to California and I can't tell you how many times I've worked a job for six months and been like, all right, this job paid off my credit card debt. I'm going to quit my job with no plan and find a different one because this isn't for me. And I can't get a new job if I'm working this job. Right. So I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. No, no. It's, I think it's the reason I asked it is because I think that a lot of people struggle with trusting themselves and trusting that inclination. And even thinking about how you went to the admissions office and and you just said, I'm going to go here. And then also when they tried to sign you up for all those generals, you knew yourself well enough to know, to advocate too, and say, yeah, this isn't, I won't stay. And I just wish that for so many others that they could have that moment of clarity too, and know to advocate for themselves. Like you don't have to always take what is presented or given to you. You get to decide if that is. Yeah. Well, it's your life that you're living. And I guess that's kind of what I've boiled it down to, especially in really recent months is I'm like, I'm living my life. And I don't really know what that means, but I'm just going to always move in a way that feels good or move towards what feels better. And if something is uncomfortable, I'm good at being like, is this uncomfortable in a I'm growing from it way? Yeah. Or is this uncomfortable in a I'm just sticking with this because it's what I know and it's like better than shooting and feels like it's better than shooting into the dark. Yeah. Um, and usually if the, it's option number two, I'm like, OK, let's just shoot into the dark then. Mm-hmm. because <laughs> that, that, you never know what's <laughs> going to come out of there. So <laughs> you don't. And if you don't take those risks or those, those changes, you miss, you can miss out on things that you couldn't have even dreamed for yourself. I think that's something I, you know, have been presented with myself many times is that things that come from change are often more than I could have imagined. I could have like, could have imagined to do. I don't know if you find that to be true too. It is very true. And I've like been doing a lot of reflecting in the past couple of months. And I would just think of all the times that I've done like the craziest thing that you could do, like, um, and had no plan. And then I was just thinking about it the other day and I was like, I've like managed to do this somehow. (laughs) I don't know how, but I've managed like every time I don't know, I'm just like, okay, well, if I just make this decision and commit to it, and do all of the things that I need to do to try to make this line up, then I don't see why it wouldn't work. And if it doesn't work, then I'll just do something different. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess it's it's the flexibility. And I think that I learned a lot of that in art school, honestly, like learning to be flexible with schedules, but also like have a schedule and learning to meet all of the criteria of a project mm-hmm. while also like breaking all of the rules of the project. Yeah. Um, And I guess I apply that to life. Like, I'm like, okay, how can I make sure that I pay all my bills and I'm fed and my dog is fed Mm -hmm. and I'm happy, but also I have enough time to like do the things that fill me back up, like go camping and sit in my studio. And honestly, I spend a lot of time sitting in my studio doing absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, what are you doing? When you're saying you're doing nothing, are you really just sitting in there and letting yourself think during that time? Yeah. And I clean. I'll just like, I can't tell you how many times I just will re-clean everything and like think Mm -hmm. about ideas and come up with ideas and pick up old ideas. And um, like, like, I guess, yeah, I'm definitely ruminating. And that is something that I think I became more comfortable with, with you as my professor in college was Mm -hmm. like, like you had stressed one semester. You were like, if it's not a final idea, like Mm -hmm. 
just keep building on it. And that really changed my, I was always like, I know it has to be a final idea if I'm going to bring it to critique. Mm -hmm. Um, And that really changed my like, oh, I can just like sit with these ideas in me. And even watching you work through like the tissues and things like that. I remember Mm -hmm. I was in school when you started talking about that. Mm -hmm. And up until recent days, I've been seeing you like ironing tissues and and like, yeah, that's an idea that's been like there and ruminating and growing and Mm -hmm. accepting that as part of the process is Mm -hmm. for me key to just life and decision-making and Mm -hmm. studio everything. Yeah. Allowing some things to be quote unquote unfinished or better yet in progress in your practice is hard because we are like society emphasizes finishing and product or productivity. And so having something yeah. That's just kind of working. It's still working its way out is, is good for your practice, but it's, it can be hard to do at the same time and let it yeah. be. Yeah, for sure. I want to do a couple things. I want to just step back for a minute into your childhood experience then where you got to, it sounds like your options were to make art or go outside when you were bored. And one thing I've been curious <laughs> about from each of my guests is is there a piece of art that you made as a child that you can recall making, or is there an experience of making as a child that still kind of sits really strongly with you that you can remember? Um, No, honestly, no, maybe not early childhood, but I do remember, well, maybe, gosh, how old would I have been? I guess uh, maybe middle school, my first year, fifth grade, Mm -hmm. I believe we had a, for one year, it was this teacher's last year teaching at my middle school was my first year with her. And we made these like, um, what are they called? Like the scene, the boxes with like a scene inside. Oh, a diorama. Yeah. We had made dioramas, but it was art class and it was kind of just make whatever you want to make. And she was trying to teach us about perspective. Mm. and things being closer and further away Mm -hmm. Um, and I remember like taking my box and just taking what I learned was ink but it was like watercolor but already liquid Mm -hmm. and it was really concentrated color Mm -hmm. and I just kind of like took it straight and just kind of sprayed like the whole corner and made like a big sunburst in the corner with the ink Uh and then took cotton balls on the other side and made like clouds and dyed those a different color and made the road go back So it Mm. looked like there was a car driving out into the horizon and Mm -hmm. through the hills. And I remember when it dried, like looking at how bright the ink and watercolor was and being like, dang, this is pretty good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, I like this. Um, And from that point on, like art was always kind of just my favorite class, Mm -hmm. art and band. So Mm -hmm. I just like those. When you're describing that and that um, it made me think back to something you said initially, and I'm glad it did. You... When you know that, because you described like, that looks good. Like that piece that you made that you just described. And then you also had that when you were describing something else you did. I think it was when you were watercolor painting in high school, maybe. Mm -hmm. So your sense of knowing also maybe extends into like, you know, when you're, you recognize when your work is good too, would you say that? And you don't, do you need external affirmation of that? Or is it more internal for you? It's. I feel like it's pretty internal, but I'm my worst critic. Um, So a lot of the times people will be like, this is great. And I'm like, no, it's not. I can't, like, even now the owner of the studio I work at, she sees stuff that I'll make and just scrap. I'll let it dry. And before it even gets bisque, I'm just going to reclaim this clay. I'll just make something better. And she's always like, why not just fire it and glaze it and put it in like a sunken sale or a sample sale. Mm. And I'm like, I don't want my name on it. Like, I don't (laughs) I don't like it. So why would I want someone else to have it? Mm -hmm. Um, And so that is very limiting for me as well. Mm -hmm. I'm very decisive and I don't really keep things if they're not, if I'm not satisfied with them. I'm just like, that's not for me. Very dismissive. Um, And that's something that I'm like learning to kind of part of having ideas is experimentation. Yeah. And I'm uncomfortable with experimentation I've found. So, Mm, Okay. So let's talk a little more about that. 
when you say you're uncomfortable with experimentation, so when you go to a project or an idea, do you work it out quite a bit in your head first before you actually start the physical making of that? And so experimentation, describe what experimentation looks like then in a way that means where you, I guess, describe how experimentation looks because of your thinking that it isn't, that you don't experiment. I'm trying to get that out right. Uh, that's a little klutzy, but. The type of experimenting that I think is, dangerous maybe versus safe those are dramatic words but like I guess the type of experimentation that makes me uncomfortable or I'm like that's not good that is not productive um is like I have a coworker and I love I literally love that she does this and she'll just take things and glaze them and layer the glazes she has no idea how they're gonna look and she just like will make a whole batch of mugs and Mm -hmm. just kind of glaze them all differently and fire them and see what works and what doesn't. And if it doesn't work, she just sells it for cheaper. And if it does work, she like keeps it as something that she likes. Mm. Um, and I'm like, my brain's like, no, no. Like if I don't know how it's going to look when it turns out, I want nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I've been trying really hard to embody that type of experimentation. Mm. Um, my brain registers it almost as like wasting time, which isn't true. Oh yeah. Yeah. That, and yeah. So oh, that's a big one. Okay. Let's just pause on that for a second. Wasting time in the studio or when you have time, do you think, is there a connection to that? And like a, a sense of scarcity around the amount of time that you have in the studio? Like I only have so much time when I'm here, so I need it to work out. Or even I have only so much time here and I need to earn my income from it. So I need it to work out. Is it, are those part of the conversation in your head around that thought or not? Yeah. You can say um, no part too. Of the conversation, I would say less like the income thing and more just um, it. I've always just found time the most stressful thing. Mm. Um, I like ever since I was little, like if I'm not up, by 5 30 a.m if I don't have most of my checklist done by like 9 a.m mm -hmm. my day's over it's mm. like I'm like I don't even this is that's it like I can't continue the day mm -hmm. um which is also very limiting and I know that about myself so lately it's just been like no even if you're not starting until 10 a.m you'll still get everything done it's mm -hmm. just I don't know how I've structured this in my head but I just like love waking up before the sun is up, having all of my responsibilities done by like 9am. Mm -hmm. Usually honestly take a nap at like 10 mm -hmm. to like 1130. Mm -hmm. And then I'll have the rest of that day to like, just not have anything on my mind and be free and be in the studio. Mm -hmm. And that feels like the most dynamic type of day for most productive type of day. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I feel like carrying that time into the studio like I'm like I'm running out of time mm, and yeah. so I think it's more just like this deeply internal like fear of just running out of time which is something that I've been addressing a lot lately because it's really bizarre mm -hmm. um the intensity of it yeah <laughs> in my head yeah um and I guess I like I have a partner who is very he just does, he owns his own business. He does interior design and build. He's like a welder and he does things on his own time. He's mm -hmm. like 30 minutes late to everything. Mm -hmm. um, he gets there when he gets there. If it doesn't get done today, that's fine. Cause he has tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I've like really been watching the way he navigates the world. And I'm like, do you write anything down? Mm -hmm. Do you have lists? And he's like, no. <laughs> So I'm just, I guess, seeing that polar opposite so closely, I'm like, dang, I need to reflect on this because yeah, I feel an urgency that's not there. <laughs> yeah. And you're, and it sounds like, I mean, this, maybe we should back up on this next part, but it sounds like you're in a place where you get to decide what your day looks like right now. Yeah. For the first time ever in my entire life. Yeah. So tell us about what you're doing. Like what maybe tell us a little bit about the transition from when you graduated with your undergrad degree to where you are now. Could you kind of spread that story out for us? Yeah. So I graduated in December of 2018. Um, and I had been to California the summer before and was like, 
it's never negative 30 degrees there and it's also not the desert Mm -hmm. I'm gonna move there so it hadn't snowed yet and it was December and I just packed my whole car up and drove across the country by myself to live with a random woman that I met on Craigslist um (laughs) and she only let me live with her because I was another brown girl basically Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. she was from India and she was an engineer and qualified to rent the place by herself And when I contacted her, we FaceTimed and she literally answered the phone and went, oh, my God, I haven't seen another brown girl in months. Um, And she was like, do you have a job? I was like, no. She's like, do you have three months of rent saved? I was like, no. (laughs) (laughs) You're like, I am winning this interview right now. (laughs) Yeah. And she was like, "Okay, well, you can live with me because you have one month of rent. She was like, live with me. I have no doubt that you'll get a job because you're social and you seem very smart she was like but um if you say no to living with me right now you're gonna live in your car for three months at least uh she and like I didn't really understand the dynamic of California but it is expensive fast paced and nobody cares unless you can pay for it Mm. a lot of the time and so I was like oh well that's harsh but okay I'll take your advice (laughs) so I moved in with her and had kind of honestly like told myself that I was never going to be an artist again Mm. I was like wow that degree I don't know why I did that like all the people around me were right I have to do anything but what I want to do um so I enrolled in a to actually to learn how to do what Steph is learning how to do right now the Mm. um user interface like type coding stuff yeah user experience Enrolled, did that for a semester, realized that I didn't want to do that, and then enrolled in a master's program for psychology for a semester, learned a lot of really interesting things, and realized at the end of that semester that I didn't want to have an office in any type of clinical building, and the amount of work it was going to take me to get a master's degree, start a private practice have my own office space outside of my home, da, 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 da. like I might as well try to be an artist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's stacked. I'll There's enough, that way. Like, yeah, enough things are stacked where it's like, you have to attain this, then this, then this in the same sort right. of way. Yeah. In the same way. I was like, this is equally as hard. And like, I don't know, I guess I had just been told by so many people like, Oh, if you move to California, you're not going to be able to do art. It's so expensive out there. Mm. Um, But what I quickly came to realize is that, yeah, it's expensive out here because people have, um, it's a very affluent community and people have the money to pay for whatever they want. And if they want it, they'll pay Mm -hmm. whatever for it, almost to a point like, because I live right right near La Jolla um, in San Diego. And it's almost to the point where like the higher you can price it, the more someone might want it. Sure. Yep. And I was kind of just like, all I have to do is get in on that market Mm -hmm. and I'm good. Mm-hmm. So. Well, can we, so that's a really interesting point though. I just want to pause that a minute too, because where you moved from here in the Midwest, like the Minneapolis, St. Paul, greater area, we'll call it. That is the opposite of what we've, you know, you find to be true. Like you can't price things higher here. People will be like, I can't afford that or they'll brush it off. So like to move into a different mentality, or see that it can be, I mean, it could be so many things, but it could be also very opening for your work and the possibilities of your work, then your artwork. Yeah. It's just completely wild. How I tell people out here is then like back home, if you go to the store and you spend $300, people are like, what on earth did you buy? Mm -hmm. Um, And here you go to the store and you spend $300 and people are like, oh my God, what'd you get? That's such a good deal. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> so just that mentality switch it also switches like the way you think about the kind of investments you can make in yourself mm-hmm. um like paying seven hundred dollars for a wheel suddenly seems a lot less like a chore when you're also paying fifteen hundred dollars a month to pay your rent right yeah um and like it's just and like when gas is so expensive you just see everything and you just kind of adjust. I always say like, cause Mackenzie Makovich mm-hmm. moved out here as oh, well. That's right. She lives like two miles away from me. Oh, wow. Um, and like, I kept having to tell her like, you have to get through your first year. 
Mm -hmm. um your first year you're like everything's expensive you're not making enough money like you can't wrap your head around it Mm -hmm. being from like small town Wisconsin the vast majority of the rest of the world is way different Mm -hmm. and that takes about a year to be like oh and then suddenly like once you kind of adjust it's still hard like paying your bills out here is not the same Mm -hmm. But once you adjust the mindset, it kind of just becomes like a, okay, well, if I invest this in myself, like you start to see return investments and things that you're buying. Like, yep. it's not just a car to get you from home to work. It's a car that gets you from home to work that in five years you can sell and still make most of your money back. So that's wow. why you buy the expensive one. Mm-hmm. Um, and like everything just becomes an investment. And that is largely like the way the community out here thinks. Mm-hmm. Everything's an investment to make a larger investment down the road. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was really eye opening in so so many ways. Mm. So when you realized that it was a plausible opportunity or thing for you to pursue your art, tell tell us more about how you transitioned. Then what did you do? Um, I started nannying mm-hmm. first because people out here pay well to have their children well taken care of. Um, And I like kids and it felt like a really consistent way to make a good income and still have time to not be in survival mode and like start thinking. I I was more just trying to clear space to start thinking about how I wanted to roll that ball. Mm -hmm. Um, And then from there, I just would reduce hours that I was nannying, Mm -hmm. Um, started working at a studio just to when I started working there it was just to start touching play again Mm -hmm. like I was like I just want a kiln and I just want it had been three years really since I'd been in a ceramic studio so I was like I just want a kiln and just to teach some classes I'm not going to keep anything really I just want to teach I like being around people and I like teaching Mm -hmm. um that was just one day a week and then that slowly became five days a week and nannying became two days a week and then nannying became like obsolete not obsolete I've been thinking about doing it again because I just I really like kids um but yeah it was just like a slow and steady it was more just understanding that it was going to take time and planning and like first you have to think about it Mm -hmm. and then you have to like just start using the material again and like finding your voice again and remembering what it felt like to find my voice the first time Mm. with the material and feeling like I'm like reverting back to being what feels like the beginning even though I'm still at the beginning Mm -hmm. um it it was really daunting but I think that I've given my I mean it's been about a year I started working at the studio a year ago so I think I just I just know my own timelines Mm mm-hmm when you first moved out there, you, I wrote down that you said you're never going to be an artist again. Can you tell us a bit more about why that was the thought you had when you first got out there? Um, yeah, <laughs> partially, partially I felt like art school, like beat the ideas out of me. Mm-hmm. Um, like, holy cow, it's a beautiful thing. I look back at some of the things that I was thinking about and like my journals and the things that I was making and relating it to like phenomenal um I was tired yeah and didn't really want to conceptualize the hard things in life on purpose anymore Mm -hmm. in that way um I almost felt I started to feel like because a lot of my work at the like now I've been making a lot of just functional work I've kind of found the beauty in that very recently Mm -hmm. um if I'm being totally transparent. Yeah. Um, I never, I never really found the beauty and like, I liked other people's functional work, never loved making. Mm -hmm. Um, and so now I've been like, I look back at what I used to make and I just felt like at the time I was just always almost putting myself in these like really hard emotional places to process things that were really hard Mm -hmm. and for myself, but largely for a grade. Yeah. Um, And I was just tired and I didn't want to do it anymore. And I didn't see it being a financially stable thing. I just wanted like stability Mm -hmm. mentally, financially, all of it. And art felt like the opposite. Mm. Yeah, Being an artist felt like very vulnerable, 
very like borderline, like putting yourself out there can feel almost if you're not ready to do it anyways, it can feel very violating. Yeah. Um, and so I feel like I just was wearing that shirt mm-hmm. still yeah, and wanted to take it off and throw it as far away as humanly possible. I didn't even want to wash that laundry. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was just like, I was like, I don't want to, I can't believe I just did that for the last <laughs> four and a half years. <laughs> Yeah, I was like genuinely, it was like that was the hardest thing I think I could have done, and it felt very self-imposed. So mm. it just felt safe, I guess, to yeah. never be an artist again. <laughs> yeah, to give <laughs> so. yourself that sort of proclamation of thought, even just I'm, I'm never going to do that again. So when you said like you realized you tried these other things, and then you realized like in order to attain, say, the the private practice for psychology as counseling, that it would be just as much work to become an artist again. How did you, besides that practical sort of realization, we'll call it, how did you let yourself believe that you were ready to be an artist again? Or how did you open that back up? Um, my, my less bullcrap answer is honestly, I started I had unfollowed everything on my social media that I felt wasn't, I didn't want to be looking at like skinny bikini models anymore. I didn't want to be like following clothing brands. I wanted to be following like recipes and art Mm -hmm. um, and like other brown women that looked like me Mm -hmm. Um, just for like beauty standards reasons. I just really wanted to like come back to myself. Yeah. And I started seeing a lot of art and ceramics and sculptures. And honestly, my, my brain started just going, I can make that. Yeah. Like, look, look how much they're selling that for. I could do that. Like, Mm -hmm. I know that I can do that. Why? Mm -hmm. What's the difference here? They're just doing it. Mm -hmm. They're just doing it, right? They're just Um, doing it. (laughs) They're just doing it. Um, That's the difference here is they're just doing it. And I'm just not. Mm. Um. Mm. And that's kind of when I was just like, okay, like then I pulled in all of the other times I've made decisions in my life where I'm just like, all right, yep. I'm going to start school here in two days. Um, Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm going to move to California now Mm -hmm. and no, I don't have money saved. And like Mm -hmm. just recapped all of these like ideas that I've had that I've pursued that have been hard, Mm -hmm. like very hard and took time to achieve and grew me an insane amount. And I was just kind of like, I think it's my time to start, <laughs> to start doing it again. <laughs> like, <laughs> if, like I'm feeling jealous and I know that, um, that's not like, I'm typically not someone that feels jealous. So there's something going on here. Obviously I want to be doing this. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I was just reading Brene Brown's new book, Atlas of the Heart. And there's a section on, um, resentment and jealousy and envy and, it hits so much with what you've just said. Like when you see someone else doing something and you might have like a negative thought towards that person, you have to check yourself because you, it might be because you want to be doing that thing that they're doing. Yeah. 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 I am. I live, I live, I don't want to say I live in that boat, but that is a boat that is in my port. Mm -hmm. Like I easily revert to resentment and like, I easily get like, like, oh, they're doing that. I'm like comparative in like this really not so beautiful way. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I've just learned to start being like, what am I really telling myself here? Like, yeah, they're doing a great job. And I know that I could do it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm not. (laughs) And I'm not. You have this like really wonderful way of like what you're articulating over and over again is you have this wonderful way of asking yourself questions and then answering with honesty, which like self-honesty can be really hard. And yeah, you do that. It seems like time and time again, which does allow you to take, to do these next steps, to take other opportunities and to see yourself and, and make yourself move in new ways. But I just, I want to acknowledge that because I think that's such a skill set and a practice, it's a practice, like it's a skill set, but it's also a practice to ask yourself yeah. questions and answer honestly. It is largely, thank you. It is largely a practice. Um, I've just, I guess I've always been pretty honest 
just in a lot of facets of my life. But part of it was just that I have always struggled with my mental health pretty hard. Mm -hmm. Um, And sometimes it's like, I know I'm being dramatic. Um, Like, I know that this is not me thinking this, even though it's me thinking it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that that awareness at the is at the root of all of that is I'm like where is this thought coming from Mm -hmm. um pretty regularly Mm -hmm. just because I'm really good at picking a thought fixating on it and just rabbit holing on that one thought Mm -hmm. until the worst possible outcome Mm -hmm. is there and I've almost trained myself to like once I'm like two feet into that rabbit hole to be like hold on Mm mm-hmm (laughs) <laughs> like you're checking yourself <laughs> Is this, are we going too far here like that sounds say that out loud once okay that sounds silly <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's not real it reminds me I have this practice with my kids because they're going through developmental stages where their impulse is is stronger than their reflection of course because they're young oh yeah and yeah. so I we have a strategy of ask yourself three times before you do something like to, if you should be doing that thing or ask yourself, like, is this a good idea? And you have to do it three times because by the time you get to the third time, you're going to hit a truth about whether or not you should actually <laughs> yeah. be doing that thing. But it's hard because they don't, you know, we all have that where our impulse is to do the reactive thing or the, like, we just want to, we want to be in it in that moment and not take the, the pause back. And so building strategies for ourselves is so critical in catching ourselves in what we do. It's so critical and I like tell everyone in my life like and this is partially this is partially you're doing I tell everyone in my life that they should read Brené Brown um oh, yeah. I have my roommate listening to the Brené Brown podcasts and like, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like have you read this book have you heard her talk like <laughs> you should like <laughs> you really mm-hmm. should. because she's got some things that when you read them you're like oh mm-hmm that's me. <laughs> I know you see yourself so easily and it's like, oh. <laughs> yeah, she's shout out to Renee Brown. She's wonderful. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Totally. <laughs> she has changed my life in many ways. Oh yeah. Yeah. So talk about, you were saying before you've been making pottery full-time for six months. Is that right? What, mm-hmm. tell us about that. Like, what does it look like? What are you making? It looks like, honestly, sometimes a hot mess. Um, (laughs) I don't know what I'm doing. I just am confidently doing it. I honestly am not really that confident in it. I'm just really good at seeming like I am. Mm -hmm. Um, I have this, my theory in life in general for everything. And I guess this is really at the bottom of my decision making is like, well, it's either going to work out or it's not. And even if it doesn't work out the way I want it to, it's still worked out. Right. Yeah. In some way. Um, like what's the worst that's going to happen here mm-hmm. is usually like, <laughs> that's like my bottom line question is I'm like, well, what, what could go wrong? Is that really that bad? Um, <laughs> I connect with that so deeply. <laughs> and like, I asked that before I send out a lot of emails, what's the worst that's going to happen? They're just not going to reply. Like that's probably the right. worst. I can tolerate that's, that. <laughs> that's okay. And so that's like largely um, what it is. And I guess like I saw this really giant gas kiln um, and was like, I need that. Mm -hmm. Called my boyfriend and I was like, you're going to need your forklift. He has a forklift. I was like, you're going to need your forklift to um, get this giant 16 by 16 interior cubic foot kiln. Like, like, and he was just like, what? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah we're gonna put it at your shop um and he was just like you're crazy um so I got it I fired it once learned that those are really hard to bisque in yeah because I had never tried to bisque in a gas kiln we always used the electric ones so then like went back to the drawing board was like okay this kiln I'm gonna keep it because this thing is like a tank we want her but not right now mm-hmm. so I retired the idea of a big gas kiln because I was just like, yes, eventually, but not this year, probably. Mm -hmm. And so then I just started making pots and like dishes. I'd never made a plate until like four months ago, Mm -hmm. ever. Um, (laughs) (laughs) 
on the wheel. Cause I feel like you hand built plates in the past yeah, though, right? But just not on the, the wheel. Yeah. No, I'd never used the wheel for anything. I like was trying to get back into ceramics and like got this wheel and like, it was just like, okay, here we go. Um, <laughs> my first like bunch of pots were really bad and I threw them all away. And then I just started getting better and better slowly. And then I remember I made a round of plates and they came out of the kiln. I was like, these are really good. Mm -hmm. These are, these are nice plates. They're like weighted nicely. I was like, this is good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, So then there was one customer at Plain Craft. That's the studio I work at who bought like an entire set of large plates, small plates, bowls and cups. Um, And I realized how much money that was. Yeah. Like, because they paid full price for each dish and each dish is like roughly 25 ish dollars, mm-hmm. which isn't even like that crazy expensive no. for a handmade pot. No, I was but thinking I was you like, could double that. <laughs> right. Exactly. But it was my first time. And I was like, wow, I just made like $400 wow. <laughs> yeah. off of one set. And so then I just started making them. I had like a whole back stock and I had just posted on Instagram, like who wants custom dishes? Um, and people started replying. And so then I just started mailing them out because I was like, okay, that's why I made a backstock. Yeah. Um, and then I got in contact with the shop manager of the Menge Museum. It's um, like the World Crafts Museum. It's international down in Bubble Park, mm-hmm. um, just through like mutual friends. And they wanted more like bare clay ceramics. And mm. Um, I still hate glazing. I don't Mm -hmm. know if that's ever going to (laughs) change. Um, so, and so like, I was like, I, I make only, like, I only glaze the inside. Mm -hmm. You want some of the, I have that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they picked up a whole line of my work that sells out of the museum shop now. Awesome. Um, which is just wild because the museums in Balboa Park are like world renowned museums and Mm -hmm. I like still scratch my head at that one because I'm just like I was like (laughs) cool (laughs) and did you um, dream that as a possibility ever for yourself or was that a total yeah surprise one that was a surprise one I never would have thought that up in my whole life um yeah I, I never would have thought that one up in my whole life so and then I guess like slowly I just have become acquainted with the artists around here who are very like more well connected a lot of like the older artists I guess um and I feel like the ball is just I feel like the ball is still just starting to roll yeah um sure like this month I this past like January I've kind of been I moved and got a bigger studio space and got an electric kiln so I can bisque my work in a kiln and not a gas kiln <laughs> um yay, yay. <laughs> <laughs> um like realized I fired I fired that kiln one time it was two days ago for the first time and it's like a really really old kiln setter like a crest Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um when I bought it the guy was like yeah the elements are brand new but wherever this thing goes that's it that's its final home Mm. um it has seen its days Mm -hmm. so he's like it'll run forever but you can't move it again Mm. um so I have it and it works great um and I guess now it's just like I have to make more stuff for the menge and I've been trying to grow the social media following mm-hmm. that feel it's a game. Um, yeah, it is. It's silly. That yeah. honestly makes me feel really uninspired. Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit. Cause I do think a lot of people struggle with it and are talking more and more about it. So like some of the things that I've heard people talk about is just that it does feel like a game. There's all these algorithms right now that are making things either accessible or inaccessible, but even more than that, like it's, it, people have expressed that it's a hard place to authentically connect with people. And if that's what you want out of it, then that's, it doesn't fulfill that. But as a, as a practicing, making, working artist, do you feel like you need to be present on there in some way? Or could you talk maybe how you're feeling about that, like have opportunities come to you through that mode or is it more through others? I mean, you've described knowing people and it seems like mutual connections are getting you connected. Yeah. I largely still think as far as making money goes, um, yeah, you can do a lot with social media, 
but I'm still on like, a, it's not about what, you know, it's about who, you know, mm-hmm. um, and just getting out there and meeting people like, which has obviously been really hard this last two years. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's in my experience and the people that I see who are successful, like monetarily successful, not social media successful. Mm-hmm. Um, they usually don't have social media much Mm -hmm. and they're out there meeting people doing things actively. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something about like the generation, maybe this is such a silly thing to say because I'm 25, but like the generation below me, like five years younger than me Mm -hmm. to them, social media is second nature. Yeah. And I think it's, like cutting videos together and like editing music and doing that stuff. Like they grew up knowing to do that since they were seven. Yeah. And like, I still don't know how to do that. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's a big difference. <laughs> um, that's a big difference. And so social media is a game. I don't think it's as, it is as important as you want it to be. Mm. Um, if you are someone who wants to make like mad international sales and like, I don't know, like the, ceramicists like Rachel Saunders she's largely popular because of social media Mm -hmm. and her presence there and like you can gain a lot of you can do a lot but it is like you are spending what it would be like a full-time job like photographing and like tailoring things and Mm -hmm. um coming up with like there's like bots now that you can pay to they'll like come up with captions for you that are engaging because like it's like there's like proven formulas to like basically emotionally pulling people's strings yeah um and getting them to engage and it's a game and I think that if that's your game more power to you I can't like I it's something that I wish that I was more motivated to do I think yeah yeah but it also sounds like it's not something that connects or aligns with the way that you want to engage or interact with the world, yeah. so to speak. Like you, you know, throughout this conversation already, you've talked about liking to be with people and liking to connect with children and, and just knowing that your your like in-person exchange with people is really where you thrive. Yeah. And, yeah. And knowing like whether I always think about temperament. I probably talked about this when I was teaching quite a bit, but like knowing our own temperament, the things that the way we like to work, the way we want to be like, and what we can tolerate and what we can't tolerate, like knowing, being able to know that about yourself can help eliminate a lot of things in your, in yeah. your, like, cause being able to move forward is as much about saying yes, as it is about saying no to things too. Like, no, this is not for me. And that's something you also described earlier too. Like, no, taking all my generals in one semester is really not for me like that. Won't yeah. Work. Um, no. Saying no is important. Mm-hmm. I would say saying no is almost more important than saying yes. Mm-hmm. I agree. I'm learning, <laughs> I'm learning that. I feel like I am just learning that, like that saying no is just a, is more important than saying yes. And that is a yeah. really counterintuitive thing to learn and do. It's, feels For backwards me. I like to say to people things like like the way I'll set boundaries is and this is very midwestern maybe passive aggressive but I'll be like okay um I could tell you that I could get that done and I could tell you that I'll have it done in two weeks but that would probably prove to be untrue mm-hmm. so I if you want me to do it I can do it but it's mm-hmm. probably going to be like like I'll give myself a two-month timeline mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> And then people are, that gives them the option to be like, yes or no, because it feels less daunting then. Cause then if they're like, yeah, Mm -hmm. and you're like, okay, cool. My timeline. Um, Yes. And then you have, yeah, you have your timeline and you can always deliver early, but that, which is way better than delivering late to something. Yeah. 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 That's the way that I go about like mitigating that a little bit. Cause sometimes saying no, just sounds harsh. Yeah. But just being like, I, I just don't have the time, but here's a nice way of saying it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when you're, okay. So you've been doing this kind of solidly for six months. What have been some of the, um, cause we want to talk about this too, like the ebbs and flows of that time. Like, have there been times where 
you felt deeply motivated to be in your studio and making, and then have there also been sort of the, op- the opposite times of like feeling really out of connect, out of connection with your inspiration or your creativity? Yeah, I feel inspired pretty frequently, actually. Mm. Um, a lot, like I just, um, yeah, I feel pretty uninspired a lot. And I would say at least 50% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's frustrating. It makes me feel frustrated, but I just have to always let myself like be uninspired. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what my, like there have been entire weeks where I'm like, I should be in my studio right now, mm-hmm. but I am still taking a nap. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess this might be me making excuses for myself completely, but mm-hmm. I'm always just like, well, apparently my brain needs the rest because it is not coming up with any new ideas. Mm-hmm. And I won't come up with ideas if I'm stressed. Yeah. And that's been like the hardest part, I think, of the ebb and flow is just like almost like surrendering to myself, Mm -hmm. I guess, like being like, I'm not in it today. Mm -hmm. Um, And maybe then like I'll do sometimes I'll do like a pinch pot exercise or like Mm -hmm. I will like try to keep my hands motivated or that's a lot of times when I'll do like computer work like there's ways to be productive. It's not just about being in the studio. That's a huge thing I've learned. You're a business. <laughs> you're a business. I, yeah. When you're doing it full time. Yeah. It, yeah. You're a business and business takes up way more time than you think. So I've just started like working days into my schedule on purpose mm-hmm. where I know I'm not going to be in the studio and I can't like, I'm not even trying to force myself to be like Tuesdays, every Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesdays aren't studio days. Tuesdays are what I call social media days. And it doesn't mean that I post on social media. I don't, but it's more just like, that's when I, cause I teach lessons out here, like at my house. And so that's when I like make the flyers that mm-hmm. I print and like put in coffee shops for lessons. And that's when I like check my email. I set up an appointment booking like thing on, I have another separate Instagram that I'm going to start just for lessons. And that's when I kind of hone in on like what I want my brand to be or really what I don't want it to be. And like, I look at other pieces for inspiration. Like I purposely build that kind of stuff in because it has to get done. And that is the most, like, if you wait until the very end, that's the most daunting thing Yeah, um, is to get it to the end of the month and be like, Oh no, I haven't made any flyers. I don't have any lessons booked. I don't have any of this. Like that's mm-hmm. half my income. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess I feel when I feel unmotivated in a creative way, I try to be like productive in a logical way. Mm-hmm. Um, and is there something you notice that happens like either in yourself physically or emotionally or just like, how do you notice when you're feeling unmotivated? Like, is there something that is like, oh yeah, like I'm, this is a sign that I'm moving into like an unmotivated period. If I have weighed out a lot of balls of clay and wedged them all and um, organized them by weight and cleaned my entire wheel and maybe even stuck a ball to the wheel Mm -hmm. and walked away. (laughs) (laughs) If I start like doing all of the motions that you need to do to do the thing. And for some reason it like is like turning a magnet around and like all it like, I can't just sit down and do the thing. (laughs) I'm I, that's when I know to just go inside. (laughs) I'm like, it's time to eat. And do something else with today because I'll be really frustrated if at the end of the day all I've done is like weigh out a hundred balls of clay Mm -hmm. and like now because then my back hurts and I made nothing and like I know that at that point I am not motivated and I don't want to be in there Mm because I'm just doing all of the things I need to do to prepare yeah and I'm a preparer little things if I've eaten lunch twice that day and the studio door is open, but I just like walk out there and then walk inside 
Mm -hmm. I usually give myself like three or four times of doing that before I'm like, obviously today is not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, what do you think? This is a question I've asked a few guests too, is what makes you stop? Like what makes you, what stops your creativity? Is there anything specific that you think kind of creates a block for you? Like you've talked about eating actually as being a way that you come back to like when you need a break, then you feed yourself or then, something. Yeah. yeah, I feed myself. I basically like, can you re-ask that? Well, I'm wondering like, so one of my specific questions sometimes is what stops you from creating? Uh, hmm, thinking too much. Mm-hmm. Um, if I have a lot of other things going on in my life, I have a really hard time creating. Mm. Um, I feel like creation is, and this is actually a quote from somebody on Joe Rogan the other day, and I blew my mind and I wanted to share it with you. I forget who this man is, mm. but he said, um, creation, creation is the place where imagination rolls and memory is not able to be recalled. Mm. Um, or it's like the space between imagination and lack of memory. So that's like where like, um, he basically was talking about like the space of possibilities. Um, but I liked that, like, like creation is just this place where you're not also tacking on like, and this reminds me of this, like that, Mm -hmm. those are like, yeah, those are ideas that you're creating, but like true creativity is kind of like, come like he feels comes from like another place of like a blank slate yeah um and I kind of really resonate with that I have a really hard time making under pressure I have a really hard time making if there's people around mm-hmm. I I relate to that it's a very internal private um it's private for me in a weird way that I didn't realize until I started having my own studio space and then realized whenever somebody came into it it felt really intrusive if I was also making at the same time. And I was like, well, that's not them. That's just like me reacting to this like moment. Um, Yeah, exactly. I think people being around, being stressed, um, those really bring me out of it. Mm -hmm. And it's mostly like, I think, because like I had said previously, I'm kind of like a fixator. Mm Mm-hmm. And if there's anything for me to fixate on other than making stuff, I will. (laughs) (laughs) That's been a big realization, I guess. Mm. So let's take kind of the, maybe like the flip side of this idea and conversation too. And like when you're feeling highly creative or highly in touch with your creativity or closely in touch with it, what what kinds of things are you doing or what are you thinking about or what, like what gets you to that place of connection with your own creative, creative thoughts and creative practice? Mm, Routines. And usually if I've been relatively physically active, it keeps my brain a little more clear and I just feel more balanced overall. Um, I guess like I'm most creative when I feel most balanced as a human, socially, physically, mentally. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that is um, I've learned like prioritizing myself and setting boundaries around my time and having a routine. Mm-hmm. Some people function best creatively when they're not on a regimented routine. Mm-hmm that's not me. Yeah. I need to like wake up, stretch, go to yoga, come back, shower, go into the studio, clean, Mm -hmm. like have an allotted, like I'll spend the first two hours doing X, Y, and Z. And like, I'm very much a, like a bullet journal type of girl. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So that's like when I feel like I'm the most productive, the most creative, the most in flow. Mm -hmm. um is when there's some type of structure Mm -hmm. like my own structure but like structure around my time and my space um structure and flexibility Mm -hmm. I guess but 
and usually I'm not making and I'm not motivated. And usually that's also when I'm like losing my keys and <laughs> not going to the gym. <laughs> like, I can't find my hairbrush that I just had 30 minutes ago and I haven't made my bed in three days. And like, mm-hmm. that is like, if I'm unmotivated and I feel gross, those are also the things that are happening. Mm. Yep. So I think making is largely like a part of like my harmonious version of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and before we hit record, we were talking a little bit about how the transition from school or formal academic art training, where you have structure, you have assignments, things are externally given to you in that way. Yeah. And then when you're not in that setting, you don't have it unless you build it for yourself. And yeah, yeah, you're touching on that now, but could you talk a little bit about that transition from like, how, how did you realize that? Like after my dog, (laughs) I I can hear in the background every now and then I'm like, Oh, 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 so sweet. He was like, where's my attention? (laughs) So I, yeah, being in school, you have a class, you have to be there. I was working almost full time. Mm -hmm. Um, I had to like do homework in between. I also had like enrolled in some extra curriculars. Like I was in dance theater for a couple of semesters. Like I was very regimented and I tell people all of the time that what, what art school taught me more than anything was time management and realistic expectations. Mm. Um, like, I don't think I would have learned that in any other, like, yeah, you learn time management. Yeah. over time but like being able to look at a piece of paper understand the assignment and be like that really is going to take me 20 hours yeah um where am I going to find that now yeah so like being aware of when I when you were wasting time like mm-hmm. that was so real when you yeah. were in school, <laughs> um that was so real of wasting time because if there's only 14 hours for you to do this drawing and it's supposed to be a 20 hour drawing mm-hmm. um you better either like really make it look like it was a 20 hour (laughs) drawing, but usually the professor knows yeah um or like not sleep and so like Mm -hmm. or you could just not waste time in between that one class and then you have that extra one hour yeah and so that is like coming out of school I think at first I was like floating Mm -hmm. in this like I have no especially when I was waitressing for a while like I was like I have no schedule Like, I don't really have to go to work. They're fine without me. And I think I lived in this like fantasy land for a while of no time. And now I've had to start regimenting myself again. Mm -hmm. Because that transition was like, it was weird. And I remember in school, professors would be like, there's going to be a time when you're done with your undergrad where you're not going to be making every day. And Mm -hmm. like, you're going to have to do da da da. And like, I don't even remember what the da 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 was because I would always just be like, (laughs) whatever (laughs) I'll be making damn it (laughs) yeah right and then like three years into not making I was like oh like you really do have to schedule this in like I used to schedule in taking classes so at time management and like not having somebody setting deadlines I've started setting deadlines and like yesterday I made a page like I've had the same list of like what I need to make for people for like two weeks for Mm -hmm. commissions Mm -hmm. and I've like chipped away at it the slowest yeah and so then finally I rewrote it and what I have made Mm -hmm. what I have not made (laughs) Mm -hmm. and in those terms instead of just like checking things off and I was like oh (laughs) I have not made very much (laughs) (laughs) yeah and so I re-looked at it and I was like okay like what do I need to use like the speckled buff clay for I'm going to make all of that today so that then I can clean my wheel up and use the other clay that I need to finish this stuff tomorrow yeah and so it is like I learned so much about time management and scheduling that I didn't even know I was learning in school Mm -hmm. and now being out of school that besides knowing how to fire a kiln and stuff time management has probably been the most useful thing I learned Mm. in academia do you plan, could we talk a little bit about that? Like in a real how-to sense, like, do you take time at the beginning of each week or at the end of the week to plan what your week will look like? Like, how do you, how do you plan yourself out these days? 
Um, usually, so I love a good Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Sundays, this is my planner. Sundays nice. are my day. And I kind of, so how I start every to-do list is I never say when it needs to be done because then I won't do it. Mm -hmm. I have to trick myself. So mine always say to do sometime soon. (laughs) And then like all right in parentheses, like preferably by the end of this week. (laughs) Nice. Nice. Gentle Um, suggestions. Yeah. And then I'll do like the primary bullet list of like, I need to like, make an inventory log for the menge. I need Mm -hmm. to do this. Like these are really important. Yeah. Um, And then there's like the subcategory of like, my driver's license is going to expire soon. Start thinking about that. Like, I guess (laughs) I'm just always like, if it's a, if it's a thought, it has to sit in my brain for a while. So I do sit down every week, but I also sit down usually in the morning. And Mm -hmm. so then I look at my, like the things that need to be done this week list. Mm -hmm. And then in the morning I'll be like, okay, so today, like I'll pick two things. Mm-hmm. Um, like today I'm going to do this and this mm-hmm. and oh yeah I need to get my license renewed like just having that thought is enough to be like okay sometime in the next two weeks like yeah <laughs> do that um, and then it'll just like slowly make its way up the priority list I guess um, yeah. sometimes you do more than two things and other times I don't get anything done on the checklist and at the end of the day I'll make a checklist of things that I did do yes and I'll check those off just so that I feel like I did so that I don't feel guilty yeah I had a friend once but, suggest that was a practice she was changing to was to write everything that she did get done in a day down at the end of the day rather than always feeling crappy about not getting the things done that they yeah. intended to. And that way you could still feel like, you know what? I did do some things during the day. These are the things. Yeah. Yeah. That's important. It's important to not feel like defeated by the things yeah. you have to do. Yeah. So I've just found like making it sound like it's like no pressure, but mm. um, then I'm like, okay, I guess I could do that. The minute there's pressure, I'm like, I don't know, like going to the post office today. I know it's going to take five minutes, but that sounds like it's going to take two hours. Yeah. And so, yeah, I guess it's just, I make a lot of lists. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that because I think that can be a really ambiguous thing for people too, is like, well, what do I do with my time? How do, what do I, how do I get going? And you can kind of feel overwhelmed by having too many possibilities of things to do with time when you do have it. And yeah. It's like, you think that's the best case scenario is like when, when you're not presented with that, but it's actually really hard to, to have so many things that you could do and then trying to decide which is the thing to do. Yeah. I appreciate that you only well, have two things for a day. Like you pick two. Can, how did you come to that place of just like, that was the number? I can rely on myself to always get two things done. Mm. Like I know for a fact, if I make a list of 10 things, two of them will get done. Mm-hmm. And so if I just write down the two things, I'm like, oh, rad, that's only two things. Like I could do that right now. And then once those two things are done, sometimes the ball is still rolling and I'll do two more. Yeah. Um, but it's just about like, I don't want to say setting the bar low, but it is a little bit about like setting the bar kind of low because then I'm like, I accomplished this. And also I know that like some days I have the most energy at 6 a.m. And by 10 a.m. I don't want to do anything anymore. Mm-hmm. My day's over. Yeah. <laughs> And like the grocery stores out here, like so much stuff doesn't open until 10 a.m. Well, <laughs> um, which is really bizarre. Like the banks don't open until 10 a.m. Like there's a lot of things you can't do until 10 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, I don't know, it just helps me like, and also I think that's been a trip is like still to this day, I'll go to go to the grocery store at like 7 a.m. and it's not open. And you can't. Yeah. And I can't. And I'm like, drive here again in three hours. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Well, also I'm wondering, like you said, you're setting the bar low by choosing two, but in some ways, you know, there's a lot of talk out in culture right now or society about, um, like maybe shifting the way we think of productivity and all that. And maybe what actually you're doing is just being far more realistic about what one can get done in a day. And instead of saying like, I'm going to get seven things done and then I'm going to fail because I only got three things done. Like that I wonder if maybe a mindset shift is also yeah I don't expect myself to be superwoman Mm -hmm. I know that I'm not her um (laughs) she's great and I'll never be her Mm -hmm. 
So I guess like <laughs> you're like, so I'm just gonna and, let that go. <laughs> yeah. So I, I let that go a long time ago. And mm-hmm. I'm not meant to like always be like pedal to the metal, accomplishing, 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 because that is what burnout is. Yeah. Um and like I've seen myself over and over and over again reach burnout. And it's like, sure, I get a lot of stuff done, but then I end up doing nothing for two weeks straight. And then it's like how much did I really get done? It's been three weeks now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I could have done two things a day for this whole three weeks and had a lot more time to myself Yeah. Um, and gotten the same amount done. Mm-hmm. Are there people or uh, like people outside of yourself that you have seen this example set for you? Or is this something that is more internal that you've just brought to yourself over time? No. I think everyone in my life has always worked a lot Mm. and like money has always been a topic of like, like when I was younger, if I wanted to play sports, odds are I couldn't mostly because my mom couldn't afford to buy another pair of sports shoes. Mm -hmm. Um, And like, that was always just very real. And I was always just kind of like, why are we giving, like, why is my mom giving so much of her time to something? If like, she doesn't even, she's not even really getting what she needs out of it Mm -hmm. fully. And especially like this day and age with like podcasting and like social media and just a lot of different ways to make connections and make an income. I've kind of just been like, it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. And I do think there's a lot of like sometimes I wake up in the morning and I'm like, wow, I wish I was somebody who could just work a regular nine to five and be stoked on my life Mm -hmm. um because for some a lot of people that works and for a lot of people that's like what they need and it's like the routine that they need but I just don't think that the majority of us were meant to live that way Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe that's just because I've always seen people who are living that way also struggle right like and that's just my own life experience yeah um but I just always figured especially in recent days, I'm like, dang, like if I'm going to struggle, I at least like, like at least right now, if I'm broke, I know it's because I'm, not, I'm probably not making things. <laughs> um, I'm not using my time wisely rather than like, I'm broke and I'm working seven days a week and I'm exhausted. Yeah. So could you talk a little bit about um, the, the break, like the, not the breakdown. I don't really care for that phrase, but like the, the way that your time is spent in your days. So you've talked a bit about your mornings and then, um, what you do, what about the pottery? So you're teaching some pottery lessons and you're making your own work. So could you tell us a little bit about that part of your practice? Yeah. Pottery lessons. I like to break up my income into different ways. And so pottery lessons in my mind are where I make most of my money. Mm -hmm. And that's just because it's true. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, (laughs) Because it's true. (laughs) Yeah, that's because it's the truth. And um, I enjoy teaching. And so normally it's like mornings and early afternoons are like jasmine time. Mm -hmm. And that's like, mornings are like that structured like ritual of waking up having a slow morning is a must Mm -hmm. um and then like my first things I do in the studio and this is like what I did right before we got on our zoom call is I go out I take everything out that I made the day before put Mm -hmm. it out on our picnic table so it dries and then like we'll start making stuff and then part way through making stuff I usually get sick of making stuff so then I'll switch to trimming the stuff from the day before and then I'll eat lunch Mm -hmm. then I'll usually like journal or make a like a what I should I'll get back in the studio and I kind of will just start to like vision board like okay this is the steps I want to make tomorrow like now that this to-do list is done I can make incense burners tomorrow or like Mm -hmm. now that this is done tomorrow morning I can start this and then I usually clean that up and that's like the end of my day yeah and then usually I'll either go to clay and craft and teach two lessons out of her facility or I will Day here and after I've like cleaned up all my stuff and trimmed it then I'll have two lessons here mm-hmm. um and so that's like the evening time like two lessons mm-hmm. 
And then I clean that up and then it's usually dinner time. Are those um, lessons like an hour or two hours long or what are the um, not, 90 minutes usually 90 minutes? That's a good amount. Yeah. 90 minutes. It's usually like the first 20 minutes I'm doing a demo and I explain everything. And then usually, so I have a wheel, my roommate has a wheel and then we have like one of those teeny tiny pottery wheels. Yeah. And so we do lessons for two typically. Mm-hmm. So then I'll do the demo on the teeny tiny pottery wheel and each of them has their big wheel. And then I start over and we all do it together basically. Sure. So that I can be like, Hey, you see how like you're getting that little like mushroom shaped undercut. That's from like the thick part of your hand cutting under because you're cupping. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I can like show them that and like show them how to fix it on the little wheel. Mm -hmm. And then they usually, it takes them about 30 minutes or so to get one piece done. And then usually the last like 30 minutes or so they have to kind of just do their own thing. Mm -hmm. Like usually the piece that I walk them through together is pretty successful and then they get another chance. And usually the second piece does not come off the wheel, but that's okay because I learned a lot. Yep. (laughs) Yep. And then I should show them how to clean up. We clean up, fill out a form and they Mm -hmm. leave. Um, And then I usually trim their work for them Mm -hmm. because I don't, it just, People don't usually come back to learn that yeah. though, unless they really want to. <laughs> <laughs> I want to turn towards your own creative artworks and the things that you're making. And one of the things I'm wondering about is, so you've mentioned you're working, focusing on functional wear right now. So that's pottery, which would be bowls and plates and cups and mugs, like things we use in our daily lives, just for people's yeah. understanding. And I'm wondering, do you have any sort of dream projects right now or art that's in your head that you would love to make like if you had time and space and access or financial support to do so like do you have any work like that that's been floating around as of late I would love to start making really I mean I've always loved really big things but I would love to start making like (laughs) side tables Um, like end tables and side tables and like bases for coffee tables and Mm -hmm. I really want to start making furniture and light fixtures, Mm -hmm. which is, I've never made them, Mm -hmm. Um, but I think I'm going to (laughs) start. Yeah. (laughs) No, I Um, think that's so fun. It's a great um, ceramic light fixtures. I mean, if you're thinking ceramics, like I've just been seeing a lot of examples as of late that it's sort of a growing area, I think. Yeah, well, and everybody that lives where I live here, whether they're like normal and renting or not, because I live in Southern California, everybody wants something that is like customly theirs. Um, (laughs) Nobody wants to buy things from Target. I love Target. (laughs) Um, So like in general, like light fixtures and like custom furniture is a really big market here. Mm -hmm. which is wild to me and like vintage furniture, people pay an insane amount for like salvage vintage furniture here. Mm. Um, And it's also just another side of function. Like when I was in school, I pretty primarily did ceramics and glass blowing and it was always very functional. And I remember at the time just being like, I don't get it. (laughs) (laughs) I just, I just, just don't get it. Like I get it, but I really, honestly, I, I don't. Um, and mm-hmm. just always like we would go into critiques and like, you you can tell when things are well made. But I was always just like, but it's also it's it's a mug. Like mm-hmm. I never got it, but I never took interest in making functional stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and now that I've been making functional stuff, um, and like, oh, I get it. Mm-hmm. Like there's all these little like decisions and choices and like like tiny artistry things and like the weight of something, like the Mm -hmm. weight of my plate matters. I don't want it to be too thin. Um, Mm -hmm. And I want to like translate that stuff, I guess, to larger art. I always liked the idea of like things hanging from the ceiling or just like giant pieces of art that were, I just always liked that idea. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So now I have like a big giant gas kiln and I have been like looking into how people like cut things apart and fire them in sections. And so Mm -hmm. I think the next weird, not weird, but the next project is going to be like 
more like wall installations and like side tables, like more design forward Mm -hmm. interior stuff. Mm -hmm. Are you working in other, are you working in other materials too right now? Or are you solely in ceramics? Pretty much just ceramics. Um, I have access to a lot of things, mostly in like, God bless him because of my partner. Mm -hmm. He's very well connected and just like, is kind of one of those people that knows how to do everything mm-hmm. um, well. Mm-hmm. So like he welds, but he also woodworks and like he can get really nice deals on like wood and mm. like really nice wood. Um, and he's got like a CNC machine so he can like basically like cut that kind of stuff out. And so he's just like, I have a lot of access to things that I never thought I would. Mm. And like, he knows where to order giant mirrors from in like custom shapes and has like a wholesale account with those people so it's it's been like and I didn't like I knew this stuff but I'm not someone to be like hey can I use you as a yeah resource but lately I've just kind of been like hey like can I use you as a resource because um I always like I want to start making this stuff and you know how and even like electrical stuff like he this kiln is a 60 watt like this is a it takes a lot of power Mm -hmm. um and he just like knew how to like redo our entire box and like fix it and make it so that we could run a kiln off of it um and so it's just more like I want to start working in other materials I just didn't feel like it was realistic until I realized that it was realistic I guess yeah Yeah. um and like that was mostly like just me talking about my ideas I kind of keep them to myself Mm -hmm. (laughs) mm-hmm (laughs) <laughs> you're working them out Never in your head people. first yeah <laughs> yeah I'm like working them out in my head first and I reach these points where I'm like but I don't know where I would get that and mm-hmm. then I because I don't know I like don't want to tell people yeah um and so it's just been a lot of like oh and but I want to start doing this and then there's always someone in the room that's like oh my brother does that or like oh I have a wholesale account or like weird and like people out here have such weird niches mm-hmm. um and like the things that folks out here like do for livings or like know people that do for livings and stuff it's just you would never imagine ever I would never like living in Wisconsin my whole life I've been like I had never even heard of smog and every single car needs to be smog checked here mm, um, yeah. for like pollution and I like moved here and I remember asking someone I was like what's smog and mm. they were like what like are you dumb and I was like that's just like it's not a thing in Wisconsin we don't deal with smog Um, we don't deal with smog it's more like too much like sometimes the water's dirty because there's a lot of fertilizer in it Um, (laughs) sad and true yeah and so um like just coming out here and just learning like the things that people do and like what it's connected to and like the industries and we're so close to LA and like the types mm-hmm. of warehouses that you can have, like you can just like bring designs places and have them manufactured and you can make five of them prototyped and it's pretty cheap. That's amazing. And like, that's how it works. And like, I met the man who does, you know, I mean, we all know Jeff Koontz, the man mm-hmm. who makes like the big. Yeah. Balloon metal, dogs. Yeah. Balloon dogs. Yeah. Um, not my most favorite art in the world, but it is interesting. And, but I met the man who does his like metal coating. Because huh. he does Taylor's metal coating. Taylor is my partner. Yeah. And so we like went to this really sketchy warehouse in LA. <laughs> and there's like this tiny man who opens the door. <laughs> and he's like, he owns this warehouse and there's just like metal and things hanging on the floor and like artwork on the floor, like mm. chaos, straight chaos, boxes everywhere, rooms with like things that were like just hanging because they'd been like freshly dipped in different things and like uh-huh. um giant vats of chemicals that are like electrically charged so that when you put metal in them like the like metal coating can like fuse to the metal mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um and I was like dang like what is this and like this yeah. is where everybody gets all of their stuff like finished like 24 karat gold finished or like yeah um he was like yeah before Jeff Koontz started like doing before it became illegal and everybody found out that I was doing his stuff. He was like, Jeff Boons was coming to me and I still talked to him all the time. Yeah. He was like, if he has smaller stuff, I still do it. I just emailing him yesterday. And I was (laughs) like, Oh, whoa. (laughs) Okay. 
um, that's a, that's a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Well, and just the fact that you're in, um, you're in a location where you have access to all these different, um, possibilities or ways to work and that it's easy. I mean, I traveled to China in 2018 and that was what the, the city that we were in was like that. Like you could just get things made in a day in a way that like you can't, when you live in other areas or it's not as easy or accessible. So to have yeah. that opens up a lot of possibilities too, for your future work. Right. It totally changes it. And like the people that you meet and like um, the people that you end up being able to work with and even like there's a furniture designer named Stefan King. Um, and he makes, he was like, I don't know, he's pretty popular. I had no idea who he was, but um, mm-hmm. like I met him recently and we went to his warehouse and I was like, oh, whoa, you make like furniture. <laughs> <laughs> like you re- really well. <laughs> um, and like him just explaining like, oh, and there's all these warehouses where if you want like, like fabrics fabricated like it's pretty cheap but like all of these makers like don't want you to know where they get their stuff made yeah um so you kind of just have to like weasel your way in a little bit but Mm -hmm. it's wild the possibilities out here (laughs) that's so I mean I feel excited for you because knowing you as a creative person and and what that could lead to um for the way your work grows and the way you grow too is exciting to think about yeah asking questions is huge. Mm -hmm. Asking people and stuff. (laughs) Yeah. Are you finding like, well, you've shared that, you know, some people are secretive and don't want people to know about these locations. Are you finding though, that at the same time, it sounds like you're encountering people who do want to share or who are willing to share information with you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm an open book. I just am a sharer. Mm -hmm. And I've found that that makes other people be sharers, even when they're not sharers. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's all it is, is Mm -hmm. like, I think that a lot of people are very exclusive and I'm just like, hi, I don't know who you are, but (laughs) I'm going to chat with you Mm -hmm. and like to see what you do and how you do it and how you got into it. And Mm -hmm. like, then they talk to me and I'm like, I'm very transparent with people. I'm like, yeah, I've started doing ceramics. I have a degree in it, but I honestly don't really know what I'm doing right now. I've been trying to do more of this, but I'm not totally sure how to do it. And usually then they're just like, oh, mm-hmm. okay. Mm-hmm. Here's a resource. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of it is just like engaging enough to be engaging. Yeah. Yep. Um, and like, people are more community oriented than you think. And I also think in LA, it's like a lot of people are like, what are you going to do to help me Mm. so that I can help you? And I think that a lot of people, like it's easy to click into that. Once you're treated like that, it's easy to click into that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not that. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people, it's just refreshing Mm -hmm. to like, I'm not asking for anything from you (laughs) (laughs) Um, ever. (laughs) (laughs) So it's just like, um, and just, just being genuine and not, yeah. not thinking of life as a business because it's not. Yeah. Yeah. You're meeting people as humans, not as what they represent. One thing before we move on to kind of the end of the session, I would like you to tell us a bit more about your current studio space or spaces. Cause you have two, you have one in your <laughs> home you're describing, and then you have another one that you go to at a art or art center of sorts. But could you tell Uh, us about those two spaces and what they look like? And yeah, so I am employed currently at Play and Craft, which is a like store slash ceramic studio right on the 101 in in Encinitas, California. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's a smaller studio. It's probably like 800 square feet, maybe 900 square feet. And we've got five wheels and like a hand building area and two like full size Scott kilns and a picnic table outside. (laughs) um, So the front area is like the store where the owner Nicole sells all of her work and she makes a pretty good array of stuff. She makes like wine crafts with wine glasses, but also like larger cups and bowls and some wall installations and mugs and candles. Um, And she's like pretty, she's a hit like locally. Like she's very, like everybody knows Nicole and like everybody owns something from playing craft and Mm -hmm. 
everybody brings their kids there. So it's very much like a community, like a community oriented space, um, which is really, really nice. You get to meet a lot of really cool people. Mm. And so I love working there. It's very clean. It's the cleanest ceramic studio I've ever been to. Nice. Um, we literally like scrub the ceiling and walls. We have a, we have a wall mop. So it's, awesome. it's, it's very clean in there. <laughs> and um, yeah, I just love working there because it's very community oriented and like a really good like central location to be like right on the 101. So mm-hmm. that's great. And then I live up in Oceanside and pretty close to the 101 as well. And we have a garage that is like I call it like a one and a half car garage, like one car and a motorcycle because it's bigger than a one car garage, but it's not two. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And we have right now, we have two big wheels. We have um, my clay boss and then a Shimpo and then the mini wheel. Mm -hmm. And then the goal is to eventually phase out the mini wheel and get three more Shimpo wheels. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we'll have five wheels total as well. Um, and start teaching lessons out of there but it's basically like it's a garage we painted the whole thing white on the inside we have built-in shelving and like it came with like shelves that roll around that are super nice and oh that's wood, awesome so that was perfect yeah um and then I have we have like a wedging cable and we made a sink so it was it's just kind of like a camping, you know, the kind of thing that you have in campers where you have like the 10 gallon tank above yeah. and it kind of just like pressures itself down and then it gathers below. Yep. Um, that's what we use for a sink. <laughs> <laughs> it works great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, it's still, we're still kind of getting it put together. Um, but it's a really awesome space. We have a ton of parking. So we just like open the gates up and like the dogs run around and people just kind of come we give them lessons um eventually we want to maybe start doing more like community forward events just because Oceanside is very like community forward and honestly people love the idea of like going to someone's house to like learn how to do something Mm -hmm. rather than a business and in general like all up and down the coast here like I've never seen a community support like local and support small businesses Mm -hmm. as much as I see here cool um like it's kind of insane and they even throughout the pandemic would be like these businesses need support and Mm. you'd see it all over Instagram and it would just kind of go around like the town and people that lived there so you knew to like shop from these people so that they would hopefully stay open yeah (laughs) um I've it's really beautiful I've never ever ever seen a community Mm. be so supportive of like startups and small businesses and Mm -hmm. um wanting to like pay people what they want to be paid so that like Mm. people like want to see people succeed in their business ventures and so it's I don't know it's really cool like being able to have a studio in the house that like also people want to like come learn at yeah and not have it be goofy (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's not like a Um, peculiar thing that you're doing this yeah no yeah. not at all um, yeah and it's just so like community oriented and there's not much there I mean there's starting to be a lot of ceramics around here but there's not it's not like the midwest yeah um there's not a lot of potters out here <laughs> so, <laughs> um it's really cool to, like watch that community kind of grow in the last couple of years um mm-hmm. as well and like people are starting to a girl that I gave her first lesson to over at clay and craft like started her instagram recently and like in her bio it just says baby ceramicist <laughs> and oh I she love just it herself like the teeniest kiln and like um a wheel and has been making like candlesticks <laughs> <laughs> um I just felt like I it just is so cool to like watch people like start their hobby and then kind of like take off and yeah do it and people here just have such a mindset of like yeah let's try it let's do it mm-hmm. um it's not negative 30 15 degrees and you're not worried about freezing so <laughs> that it, helps it feels I think it just I think it helps like it makes people just be like yeah we could do anything mm. whether it's true or not <laughs> <laughs> so that's um I, I, I swear it has to do with the weather though <laughs> I'm sure it helps because yeah when we go into our in the midwest with that colder winter cycle it does like encourage you to be indoor more than outdoor but unless you embrace outdoor activities, which is part of it too. Yeah. Yeah. How I 
like to wrap these up is what I call like studio time wrap up. And it's a series of just four questions and, um, you can take as much time as you want with any one of them. It doesn't have to be fast or it can be that part's all up to you. And, okay. um, the first one is a finish the sentence. And so I'd like you to finish this sentence when I don't know what to create or make, I make plates make plates lately yeah i've been really enjoying making plates so if i don't know what else to make i just center some clay and squish it all the way down <laughs> and call it a plate <laughs> um <laughs> that's like one way um or i just completely let it be i understand that that's how i'm feeling that day and try to find another way of mm. being productive like i had said like checking emails or doing like the less fun stuff usually then if you do the less fun stuff and you're feeling unmotivated you're a lot more motivated to do the fun stuff the next day mm -hmm. yeah kind of so. hits you like okay if you're not gonna do the fun stuff then you can <laughs> do this stuff <laughs> yeah okay wonderful the next one is um I asked you to share five songs that you could listen to on repeat in the studio or anytime and so I'm going to share what the songs were that you sent me and then I have a question about six. them. Probably, but I don't really care. Like if it's, okay. <laughs> it's five or six, I didn't even notice, to be honest. I was just like, okay. oh, these are fun. And I listened to your playlist this morning before we talked, because I like to do that just to kind of like, I don't know, to hear like the mindset of the person maybe. So your first song was Lavender by Camus. And your second one is What's Up by Four Non Blondes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that one kind of made me laugh when I heard it. I was like, oh. Cute. And then um, Bins by um, Solange and Sweet Disposition by The Temper Trap, Die Young by Max Frost, and There She Go, There She Go by Garen Sean. And I'm wondering if you could share how these songs maybe contribute to creative flow for you. Um, a lot of them are, they're, they're kind of the same tempo. Mm. Um like largely <laughs> so, <laughs> so a lot of it for me is like the pace that I want to be working at and mm. it's upbeat like a quick walk mm. um you know like I don't want to be running but yeah. I don't want to be strolling either mm. um so I like I like that pace um I feel like all of them are like I don't know. I feel like the song Lavender makes me feel like I'm like falling in love with something. Mm. Um, and Four Non Blondes is just like, you can't listen to that song and not, you can't be angry. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I really just appreciate that that song exists. Um, <laughs> because it just, like, it's one of my all time favorite ones. Um, and oh goodness. I forget what other ones the Garen Sean is just kind of dancey um it's enough noise that you can like listen to the song but without it being distracting mm -hmm. sometimes things get distracting for me mm -hmm. I'm really easily distracted and what other ones did I send you uh bins by Solange and then sweet disposition and die young Oh, Benz is amazing. Um, it's just one of those pace songs. Um, I just also think that Solange is a really interesting artist. Um, and that's like my favorite song by her. It's just mm -hmm. got like a really good vibe to it, I guess. Mm -hmm. And Sweet Disposition is just a feel good. Like I imagine driving down the road with like my hair down and the windows down and the sun out. And uh -huh. like it's like sunset time um, and you just had a really good day. And I think that that's like a feeling that mm. that's how I want to feel when I'm in the studio. It's like I just <laughs> had a really good day. <laughs> um, and I want to replace the other one that I gave you because there's actually one that I've been listening to in the studio um, that is maybe a little bit more fitting. Okay. And you know what? I'm not going to be able to think of the name of it because that is where we're at right now but um it's it's right in here oh it's did you think by arlie 
Mm. Um, and it basically talks like the um, the chorus is like um, like basically, did you think it'd be easy? Because if it was easy, then everybody would do it too. Like, and it's <laughs> like um, if you're not making like every minute that you're not working towards your dream, it's you're wasting your time. <laughs> um, but it's like it's like it's also like upbeat. Like it's like talking about a guy who wanted to be a rocker, and it's like it's kind of like the first line is like, um, never thought you'd be the kind of guy to get a day job nine to five. Um, Mm -hmm. you're going to take off, you're going to go against the grain. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, it just kind of talks about how like those big ideas aren't easy. Mm -hmm. And, um, that one has been a big motivator. If if I am feeling unmotivated in the studio, if I play that really loud (laughs) and like sing along, (laughs) it's a really good reality check. So, Well, it says a lot of the things that you said earlier about like how you're thinking about your workday and what your workday looks like and what other people's workday looks like and um, how that makes you feel or makes them feel. And so it feels like really connected and reflective of what you've been sort of thinking through in your own work, in your own practice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like they literally say, uh, why are you sitting around? Did you think it'd be easy? Because if it was (laughs) easy, then everyone would do it too. Yeah. You're right, Arlie. <laughs> Fine. Okay, I'll move. <laughs> I'm doing it. You're right. <laughs> well, my next question is, um, what brings you joy in your creative life? Oh, goodness. O- opening the kiln <laughs> and seeing things, even if they exploded. Um, I exploded my giant bowl that I made earlier Mm. this week and I made a huge bowl and I was so proud of it. And I knew that I needed to let it dry for another day, but I really wanted to fire the (laughs) (laughs) and it, it exploded. And I was just kind of like, it was still satisfying because I was like, I knew it was going to explode. It it affirms like your technical knowledge. Like I do know enough to know. (laughs) Right. I, I, I had a feeling, um, so it's, I think that like opening the kiln and just like seeing little improvements, like being able to put eight pounds of clay on the wheel and like center it, like with mm-hmm. relative ease mm-hmm. and like make it into a bowl. Like five years ago, if you would have told me I was going to be doing that, I would have laughed at you. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like I, I'll never use the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never use the wheels. <laughs> I think I remember you trying to like do assignments that said you needed the wheel and not using the wheel. Like, I feel like we worked around it sometimes. Yeah. I would like use the wheel a little bit. Like when it came to wheel throwing mugs, I would like wheel throw like a really, really thick cylinder mm-hmm. and then just cut it off and then pinch it so that it was like, it was like, it was on the wheel. Like, <laughs> um, so like that. um, So I guess like seeing, like just watching myself evolve and grow and Mm. like that brings me a lot of joy. I'm also a very like pretty self-aware person. So I'm, when I reach milestones, I'm like, dang, like I did that. Cool. Yeah. Um, I'm so I just can't being able to congratulate myself. Yeah. (laughs) No, seriously, Jasmine, that's such a good thing. I've been looking as I look at my calendar and plan, I'm like celebration day. Like you need to put some celebration days in here when you finish certain things. And when you get like, it is important to celebrate those, those milestones and those stops and places. Huge. And even just thinking back, like I've been trying to reflect more and like at the end of every month or like at the end of 2021, I like looked back at my year because I was kind of like, oh, that was like a dot of a year. Um, but then I thought about it and I was like, actually, that might've been the best year I've had so far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> like, and like just reflecting on those things and being like, I did this, like I was able to do this. And, mm-hmm. um, I don't know. I think that that's something that more people should do is like, just congratulate themselves. Like the, the smallest things are actually really important. Mm-hmm. Um, and the more you celebrate the small things, like. I think the more you're motivated to do them yeah, and like small things really add up to bigger things. And yeah, like, it's just about doing things. Like I always tell people, like my favorite thing to tell people, they're like, well, how do you do these things? And like, well, the best way to get things done is to do them. Yeah. It's so true. Um, <laughs> and, like, 
<laughs> um, that's just like, I guess what I, what it boils down to is I'm just like, well, if you want something done, you, you're either going to do it or you're going to pay someone else to do it, or they're going to do it on their own accord. And it's, I'm doing it. So mm-hmm. then it, then it makes decisions really easy then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. It definitely yeah. does. Well, my last one is another finish the sentence and it is finish the sentence. Oh. My creativity is. My creativity is a lot of fun. <laughs> um, it is always evolving and taking on new interests and um, motivating me to try new things Mm. or look at things in a different way. And I think it's kind of one of the more important parts of my life at this point. Mm. (laughs) So Mm. um, it's just fun to like, yeah, it's fun. It's fun to be able to like foster that part of myself consciously Mm -hmm. um, and give it grace when it needs grace and like give it attention where it wants attention and not be like slapping myself on the wrist because I want to be a creative person, but instead just being like, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) This is how I see the world. (laughs) Um, And it's just been fun to like let that part because I feel like so many people identify with their independence and that's been me in the past or like, they're this or they're that and like all of those things that do add up and they make you who you are um but creativity is fun like choosing to have that be part of like who you are what you tell people like who are you um Mm -hmm. I'm creative rather than just being like I'm an independent woman yeah um having creativity as part of your identity it has been it's just fun it's fun Mm -hmm. I like that yeah thank you for that that's the end that's the way good way to think of it and kind of like it again I think it like relates back to celebrating too like when you say your creativity is fun that's to me like that's a celebration as well and it's a welcoming of it in your life yeah yeah for sure it's a part of everyone like everyone has creativity it's just whether you choose to identify with it or not Mm -hmm. yeah nature or nurture Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> recognize it use it just yeah do it. <laughs> the amount of people that I meet especially giving lessons at clay and craft that are like I've just never been a creative person I'm like that's just not true yeah <laughs> uh, like I'm the first person to be like ah, mm, that's wrong I'll hear you out here but I think you're wrong and they usually <laughs> laugh and I'm like you're saying you never liked drawing or growing up. Like you never enjoyed playing games. You never played dress up. Like you were never that kid. Yeah. And then people are like, oh no, I did that stuff. I'm like, okay, well, there's something creative in you. <laughs> yeah. They don't recognize that as being a creative act though, by the time that they're aging up or whatever. That's an interesting. Ugh. Yeah. Playing hmm. dress up with kids is the most creative thing you could do. Oh my gosh. <laughs> It is wild. <laughs> it is. They're like playing dolls and you have to build, like have narratives. Like my kids are really into having narratives with their dolls. And they, mm-hmm. my one daughter likes to control the storyline a lot. So she doesn't really want anyone mm-hmm. else to contribute, but it's a creative act for her to imagine what this life is like with these dolls and what they're doing. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's fun to think about. Well, Jasmine, thank you so much. Aries. No, this one, that's my Virgo daughter, actually. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, yeah. Okay. That makes sense too, though. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> Got to control the narrative. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> <That's so funny. laughs> yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing all the reflections that you've had on your creative path. I really appreciate that. Thank of course. You. Thank you for the conversation. That was it's amazing talking to you, but it's, it's also amazing, like reflecting in that way. I haven't taken that kind of a step back in a little bit. Mm-hmm. So thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm-hmm. 
Let's take inspiration from Jasmine this week. As she said, I can always rely on myself to get two things done. What are two things you could do each day for your creativity or just for your life in general? Or maybe instead of making a to-do list, make an I did this today list and fill it with the things you did do that day. Include small things and big things. And if you're wondering, yes, getting dressed and brushing your teeth should be on the list. One more thing. Take time this week to celebrate yourself. Reflect and celebrate something you accomplished and are proud of. Tell some dear friends too so they can celebrate you as well. To learn more about Jasmine's work and personal pottery lessons, follow her on Instagram at jasminecolette.studios, which is spelled J-A-Z-M-I-N-C-O-L-E-T-T-E dot studios. As always, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the podcast, please share it and rate and review wherever you listen to your podcast. Until next week, bye.